All right. Um, it's seven o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Sam, and I'm so excited to be here with um, Wes Jackson and Robert Jensen to talk about searching for sustainability. Um, before we get into the program stuff, I just want to do a, a couple quick library plugs, online events that we've got coming up this month. Um, a week from today at 6.30 p.m., we have a, a tech talk with our technology guru, Nathan Carr. He's going to talk about alternative reality versus virtual reality. So if you want, want to know what those are or what the difference is, you can tune into that. And then on Tuesday, the 18th at 7 p.m., we've got Florence Schloniger, who uh, a lot of people in, in Newton know, and she's got a new book of poetry out called Crossing Flint. And she's going to give a talk about that book and also about her journey with um, recognizing Native Americans and their, um, their ancestral claim to the land that her great grandfather homesteaded. So um, tune into that, it should be really interesting. Then a week after that Crossing Flint event on May 25th is our monthly photography program. Uh, former Harvey County Sheriff T. Walton, he now lives in the Seattle area but he will be uh, joining us virtually back in Newton to show his, his photographs of the, uh, you know, the Pacific Northwest. And uh, I've seen them and they're really cool. So that should be a fun program as well. So there's lots more on our website and on our Facebook page about those things. Uh, and now I'll just say a little bit about, um, about Wes and uh, Robert. Uh, Wes is the founder or co-founder of the Land Institute in Salina, and he um, he is a MacArthur Genius Fellow. I think that's pretty cool, and uh, many other uh, great honors. Definitely a, a leader in the international sustainable agriculture movement. And Robert Robert Jens, Jensen is an emeritus professor in the School of Journalism and Media at the University of Texas in Austin. Um, he and Wes have a podcast together called Podcast from the Prairie, which if you enjoy this program, which I'm sure you will, you should definitely go and seek out those episodes of Podcast from the Prairie. And um, it uh, says here that he collaborates on the Ecosphere Studies Program at the Land Institute, which sounds pretty cool. Um, so maybe I know that we'll learn more about both of these, uh, both of these gentlemen in the program here. So I will turn it over to them. Uh, there will be time for some Q&A at the end. So if you think of a question during the program, you can go ahead and type it into the chat or those of you on Zoom, we also have the Q&A function and we will just uh, store those up and um, I will pose uh, as many questions as I can to Wes and Robert after their uh, presentation part of the program. So uh, Wes and Robert, I will uh, turn it over to you. Thank you, Sam. Uh, this is Bob Jensen. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start us off here. Uh, I don't want to get in a game of one-upmanship with Wes, but Wes was a MacArthur Fellow, and they do call that the Genius Grant. A lot of people don't know I was an Arthur Fellow, and that's a, a grant for people who aren't that bright but always show up on time. So I'm very proud of that award. Uh, that's always been my strength. So um, we have two books we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, this is the one I wrote called The Restless and Relentless Mind of Wes Jackson, Searching for Sustainability. But we're gonna spend most of our time tonight on Wes's book, Hogs Are Up. Uh, and if people are really nice to us, we'll even explain where that title came from. Uh, so really quickly, I'm a retired uh, professor uh, and I first bumped into Wes's work when I started graduate school more than 30 years ago now. And although I'm not an ecologist or an agronomist, I've never been a farmer, uh, I don't work in the sciences. I, I pretty quickly understood the importance of Wes's worldview, no matter what kind of work one was doing in the world. And I became a, a big fan of Wes's writing, uh, listened to tapes of Prairie Festival. I'm sure some of the people listening tonight have been to Prairie Festival, that great September event at the Land Institute. And so uh, I was following Wes's work for a long time before I finally got a chance to meet him and then eventually work with him. And, and I'm just gonna tell you the story of how this book came to be. Uh, Wes has three or four other books prior to these. Uh, you can find endless YouTube video of him. Uh, he's given talks everywhere, but I thought it would be nice if there was a, a short 
summary of Wes's key ideas because so many of those ideas had been so important to me. And so I, uh, I approached Wes probably after a Prairie Festival one time and I suggested that he write such a book now that he had retired from running the Land Institute day to day. I said, why don't you look back, gather your key ideas and produce the kind of book that you know uh, we can then distribute widely. And I, I even gave him a proposed outline and he was very polite, he took the outline. He said, uh, I'm gonna study this, thank you very much. And then a year later, nothing had happened. I was back at Prairie Fest and I said, you know, Wes, I still think that's a great idea. I'd love a short, you know, concise book of your key ideas. I gave him a different outline. He took it, he said, thank you very much. I'm gonna study this. By that time, I started to understand what I'm gonna study this meant. Um, it was a polite way of saying, get lost, kid. Uh, so Wes is not the kind of person who, you know, wants to look back and already summarize what he's already thought. So I wrote this book because Wes wouldn't. Uh, what I tried to do was take those ideas that had been so powerful when I'd first been exposed to them over those many decades and organize them for people like myself, people who aren't farmers necessarily, aren't ecologists, uh, and try to put Wes's work in some kind of context. And so that's, uh, that's the restless and relentless mind of Wes Jackson. And I think the title does indicate that that restlessness of Wes's always always moving forward. Uh, so I highly recommend that book, but I don't much want to talk about that book tonight. Uh, what Wes and I are gonna do is actually focus on some of the stories in his book, Hogs Are Up, which is a more narrative driven book. And uh, we thought we'd start with the, the first story in the book, which is called Year of Decision, 1976. That was the year the Land Institute was founded it was founded actually as an alternative school. A lot of people who know the Land Institute and its work know it for its work on uh, perennial polycultures. That is the idea that we can shift from annual grain crops, you know, row after row of wheat or barley or uh, soybeans, corn, and actually grow perennial crops in mixtures. That's what West calls natural systems agriculture. And that's the idea that led to the MacArthur Award and, and other honors. But the Land Institute started in that very experimental time of the early 70s as a, an alternative school. And uh, Wes, uh, could you tell the story of how you made that decision to start the Land Institute back there in 1976? And then as the story in the book uh, indicates, what was the rest of the story? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I'll, I'm, I intend to tell the truth mostly. <laughs> um, uh, the uh, we had been back uh, in our house and home on 28 acres, which is just outside of Salina, uh, along the Smoky Hill River. Been there for two years. Um, we had bought the property and had built on it when I was teaching at Kansas Wesleyan. Uh, that was in the late 1960s. And then a faculty position opened uh, at California State University in Sacramento. And they hired me to start an environmental studies department. And uh, so that took the family and me west. Uh, in 1971, but we held on to the Kansas place. And um, when I took a one year leave, we went back to Kansas. And that one year stretched into two years. And then came the call from Sacramento that I expected but dreaded. I was told unequivocally that I had to either return to my position in Sacramento or resign. Uh, it was as simple as that. And from a professional point of view in Sacramento, I had a good job with tenure in the academic world. And so the choice, security in California, a decent salary, health benefits, security, money, uh, they were not there in Kansas. But, um, you know, 
Sacramento was a good place. Uh, it's the capital of the state. And a lot of the federal offices were there and there was plenty of opportunity for students in environmental studies to be able to get jobs, should be able to have a big influence on the culture. Well, <clears throat> the thing is we, we left uh, and I said that I was coming back, but then why did we sell the house? And why did we load up all of our belongings and bring it with us? Uh, and so we, we um, had to either make a choice. Uh, we had to choose. So uh, uh, we had family here in and around Topeka. My mother was still alive and so on. But as parents, we worried about the future and about how we might prepare ourselves and our children, um, developing the, the skills for an uncertain future. Well, I uh, um, was given an opportunity to um, attend a weenie roast uh, at a friend's house, our family was. and. Um, I had talked to John Simpson, who was a state senator at the time. And I was telling him about the possibility of starting a school. I didn't know if we would or not. And he said, well, if you want to start a school, I'll help you. And uh, so our family had a gathering and um, weighed the pros and cons. And uh, I said, well, we better go back. And uh, my daughter, then 15, Laura, said, but I thought you always said we're not called to success, but to obedience to our vision. Well, I resigned. Well, I told that story just as I'm telling it now, more or less. And we were at Laura's house uh, with her family. And there were several, she's at University of Northern Iowa as a professor, she and her husband both. And um, so there were several of their friends there and they were wanting to know how it was we started the Land Institute. And I just gave a gesture with my hand and said, well, she's the one. Uh, if it hadn't been for her, you know, out of the mouths of babes and so on comes the wisdom. What not? Well, she said there's more to that story. I'd been to seven different schools and I didn't want to move again. <laughs> and uh, as a consequence, the Land Institute started because she didn't want to change schools. <laughs> so all that high sounding rhetoric uh, that uh, we're not called to success, but to obedience to the vision. Well, I had never told that story around her, but I told that story all over the continent, practically. Uh, and uh, so that's the way I open the book. There are stories, and then there is the story. Uh, stories have a way of wiggling around. <laughs> and uh, Wendell Berry said to me once that uh, never there's a saying that his granddaddy had, never pass up the opportunity to improve a true story. <laughs> so uh, I've tried to stick to the truth, but everybody knows that's hard. <laughs> well, I love that idea that a teenage girl knew you well enough to know that the the most effective way to get a, to get her way, which was to stay there, was to use your own words against you. I thought that was uh, pretty insightful. Yeah. Uh, now you you mentioned you are from Kansas. Your family's from around Topeka. Uh, you grew up on a farm in North Topeka. Uh, that leads me to think about one of my other favorite stories from the book, which is called "Over the Fence Is Out." softball rules at West Indianola District 93. 
And that's the story where you tell about how as kids in, in your elementary school, you kind of organized your, your own play. Uh, there was no little league uh, or, or similar things. So wh what did over the fences out mean in your elementary school? Well, a little of the background about that school. It was a two room country school. Uh, there were usually around 40 kids in the school, 20 in the little room of grade one to four. There was no kindergarten. Uh, and then uh, four in the big room, five through eight. And it was an eight month school because it's a rural school. And, uh, you know, they needed help on, on the farm. Uh, so um, the, uh, it was back during the period in which polio was still rampant. And uh, in our school, there were three people with polio. Uh, the big room teacher had had polio. She was uh, crippled. And then there were two girls in the little room. And uh, one was serious enough braces on both legs. Another um, had to uh, walk by holding one leg, uh, hand against one leg. But uh, the girl, those girls played ball with us. That is, they would bat, and then somebody else would run the base, run the bases, and uh, uh, and they, you know, they they had they knew the rules, and uh, one was given, I think, four strikes, and one was given five strikes. I mean, how those rules came to pass, I don't know, but uh, they were just there kind of like the school was there. Uh, and usually the teachers weren't around. They were off with the little kids uh, over around the teeter-totters and swings and so on. Well, we also had a rule and uh, there were two or three guys, particularly Jerry Blyer, that uh, if they hit the ball, it could go over the fence. Well, that's no way to have a ball game is to have the hit a ball over the fence because how are you supposed to be able to play to field a ball if it's going over the fence? So we had the rule over the fence is out. <laughs> and so if Jerry knocked one over the fence accidentally, uh, he had to go out in the field. And uh, I thought that was many times that isn't that bad an idea. Uh, why can't we all? <laughs> you know, be able to play all the time? Why should there be somebody that gets to stand up there and bat all day long? Uh, or all recess long. So uh, I, I uh, think that it has some implications for the future politics even. <laughs> and uh, a different kind of economic system maybe. Uh, well, there's two things I love about that story. One is uh, it, it goes against the, the kind of Lord of the Flies idea that if you let kids to their own devices, you know, they'll destroy each other, that it'll be dog eat dog. There, there's a kind of cooperation that came naturally, uh, it sounds like. Uh, I always think when I read that story that you all were, were budding anarchists, you know, self-organized, uh, you knew how to do it on your own. And I also like the idea um, that it didn't take adult supervision. So much of children's uh, play life these days is organized by adults. I thought that was, uh, would have been great. I, I, I was jealous of that experience when I read that story. When... Well, imagine poor Jerry Blyer knocking <laughs> over the fence and then having to throw the bat down in disgust. <laughs> Well, I, I was one of those kids who never hit a home run, so I would have enjoyed those rules especially. There was no risk I was going to hit one over the fence. So there's a lot of stories in the book about your upbringing, but also not just what happened on the farm, but the consequences of that. And I'm going to ask you to talk about one, another one of my favorites. Uh, if we went on forever, it would sound like every one of these stories in my book in the book is a favorite, and that's kind of true. Uh, this one's called Brother Harley 
at the European Union Parliament. And it's a yeah. story of when you and your wife, Joan, and Harley, your brother, were in Europe. You were getting a tour of the European Union Parliament building. Uh, and, and some of that training from the farm showed up in a comment to Harley. So tell us that story. Well, <clears throat> the cast uh, for this one act play uh, is my wife, Joan, my brother Harley, who's eight years older than I, um, and a German guide and me. Uh, and as you point out, the setting is the parliament of the European Union in Brussels. And the year is 2000. And I'd given a short informal talk earlier in the day to the European Greens. Well, the European Greens are gone and the German guide under the direction of a nonprofit in Stockholm uh, resumes his obligation to show us around. Now all's going fine until the guide says that given the additional countries that will be coming into the union, remember this is the year 2000, uh, that will be coming into the union, uh, this parliament building will not do they will have to build another one, build a whole new parliament. Well, that, with that sentence, Brother Harley, he leaves the three of us and walks to the back of the assembly hall. The German registers his departure with a glance and continues his narration to Joan and me. We witness with more than, you know, uh, that this is a grand place and uh, we listen, and the interest is more than merely dutiful. So I'm thinking Harley should be here listening with comparable interest. But he continues to walk to the back, looking left and right, and up and down. And during a short pause in the guide's narration, I receive an order from the back with a tone of urgency that I might have heard back in the fields or in the barn, on the farm, I see his long arm attached to a six foot three frame with that index finger beckoning me over. I immediately become eight years old and he's 16 and I dutifully make my way to the back of the auditorium. This time, he wants my opinion on what he's pondering. I pretty well figured out what's on his mind. And so I'm not surprised when he asks, while thumping with the back of his hand against the wall, you think this is a bearing wall? <laughs> the German guide and Joan arrived from the front while I stuttered, you know, I'm, well, is this a bearing wall? Uh, in fact, it's a load-bearing wall uh, is something you have to think about. Um, and uh, so he asked the German the same question. Uh, now, he's already determined that it's not a load-bearing wall, but I guess he's being polite to the German. And, uh, but then he asked the German again, this space here at the back, what do they do with it? Now the German doesn't know. He says something about receptions. Harley says nothing, but I know he must be thinking that receptions are frivolous. Maybe even think they bring their own lunch or eat ahead of time and whatever. So the questioning though isn't over. How many did you say would be added? The German gives a ballpark approximation. Harley then begins counting seats and rows to get a rough estimate of this um, and, and this this uh, this uh, assembly is one in which it kind of pinches its way um, toward the front. And uh, he finally says, I don't think you need a new building. Look here, all this room here at the back. Now, Harley didn't follow up, 
maybe he thought it was enough for the German to hear and then get back to whoever might have a say in such matters. But uh, it wasn't beyond him to try to solve this problem of all of Europe uh, on, on, uh, on whether they needed a new, new building or not. Uh, now, that story is in there. I put it in there partly, well, it's a true story, but uh, what's going on there? Uh, this is um, it's coming out of a family that's paying attention to necessity, coming out of a family that lived through the Depression, coming out of a family in which two brothers went through World War II in the Pacific. It's coming out of a period in which uh, there's been a great deal of scarcity and we're paying attention to ways to, uh, um, to uh, well, uh, live, uh, as Milton put it, according to the holy dictate of spare temperance. Uh, so, uh, but some would consider it plainly naive. I would say, a person engaged in the world. I, I think about that a lot. Um, how how much has changed? Uh, not just because um, you know you went you grew up in the Great Depression, so of course frugality was crucial. But farm life was defined by um, that frugality, by using what you had, by not buying new just because something wore out, you tried to fix things. Um, we've talked a lot, Wes, about how in the, the future, uh, a future that you and I think is gonna be defined by downpowering, less energy, less material, less affluence. Those, uh, those skills that come out of that frugality are gonna be more important uh, again. Would you agree? I certainly do. Uh, I think this downpowering, we're going to be looking at uh, uh, considerable uh, parts of the past. I mean, there's a lot of technology that has come in that period of time as a result of fossil fuel that is still going to be usable. But uh, we're going to increasingly get by with a sufficiency of people rather than a sufficiency of capital. And I think that it can be a, a, a satisfying, uh, mm. could be in some respects satisfying. It's a matter of the reestablishment of, uh, of rural communities. Yeah. And uh, the other day I uh, made a trip to Hutchison uh, from my house to where I was going in Hutchison is actually 60 miles. And on a pretty fancy road in which I passed up lots of places that uh, used to, there's several places that used to uh, be towns. Mm -hmm. And now we bypass those. And so that loss uh, of, uh, of uh, rural America, I think is, uh, is going to be, it's going to be challenging for how we deal with that. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, the other one, if, if we're looking for a quick solution to climate change, um, now, of course, we're not going to do it, but what if we said, okay, let's shut down the whole interstate system <laughs> and then force people to make their way from one town to another? It'll be slower, but there'll be more of an economy then going on in all of those little places. Uh, instead of 80 miles an hour in order to get from Salina to Wichita as fast as possible. Uh, that'll concentrate our minds. Uh, so, but <clears throat> those are solutions probably that uh, will have to be well thought out and widely agreed. <laughs> well, first of all, a quick footnote. Of course, your, your family is rolling in its grave because that uh, interstate highway system began in the administration of Dwight David Eisenhower, who is, uh, what, a second cousin once removed of yours or? or oh, no, he's, uh, he's my, mother's, uh, my mother's cousin. 
Yeah, that's right. First cousin, and I'm a first cousin once removed. Yes, yes, uh, okay. Now, you know, if this gets to be a bad idea, why I'll not claim any relationship. <laughs> um, as you were talking, I thought of uh, a phrase I've heard you use many times when you talk about these, uh, these habits of frugality, uh, what life was like when fossil fuels didn't dominate rural America so much. And you point out you're not just uh, pining for the old days. You say, this is not a matter of mere nostalgia, but of practical necessity. That if we are looking at a future with less energy, uh, where we walk more lightly on the planet, uh, it's going to be a practical necessity to remember those skills. So. Uh, this isn't just nostalgia for you. Uh, you also mentioned the importance of rural communities and the threat they have been under. And that leads me to another of my favorite stories in the book, uh, the story of the Matfield Green Women's Club. Now, uh, people in Newton probably know Matfield Green, I think is probably just about straight west of Newton, probably an hour or so, I'm guessing. Uh, that, that's a particularly poignant story. Uh, if you could explain why you were in Matfield Green uh, back then and what you learned from that experience, uh, from that story about the Matfield Green Women's Club. Well, we had a presence in Matfield Green, uh, partly because of opportunities, the chance to buy uh, a house there. One could buy a house for five hundred to a thousand dollars, we bought the whole school. Uh, four of us did for five thousand dollars. Then we gave it to the Land Institute. I was interested in a kind of uh, elect ecological community accounting. We'd done a in the midst of a sunshine farm study, a ten-year study of getting all the way at the embodied energy of the conventional agriculture. And so what could, might we do in a place like Matfield Green and get a, an assessment? So, <clears throat> the, uh, so I was there on and off in this town of was just 56 people at the time. It's in Chase County. Uh, the, uh, and I have to say I had great fun tearing off the porches and clearing up the yards. Uh, but it was sad as well, going through the abandoned belongings of families who had lived out their lives in this beautiful, well-watered, uh, fertile setting. In an upstairs bedroom, I came across a dusty but beautiful blue padded box labeled Old Programs New Century Club. Now, most of the programs from 1923 to 1964 were there. Each listed the officers, the club flower, which was the sweet pea, the club colors, pink and white, and the club motto, just be glad. <laughs> the program for each year, uh, the programs, um, were gathered under one cover and nearly always dedicated to some local woman who was special in some way. Each month, the women were to comment on such subjects as canning, jokes, memory gems, a magazine article, guest poems, flower culture, misused words, birds, and more. The May 1936 program was a debate, quote, resolved that movies are detrimental to the young generation. The August 1936 program was dedicated to coping with the heat. Roll call was hot weather drinks followed by suggestions for hot weather lunches. And Mrs. Rogler offered ways of keeping cool. 
Now, the June roll call in 1929 was the disease I fear most. That was 11 years after the great flu epidemic. Children were still dying in those days of diphtheria, whooping cough, scarlet fever, pneumonia. On August uh, the 20th, the roll call uh, question was, what do you consider the, uh, the, the most, in, in, just a minute, I was reading this here. The, what do you consider the most essential to good citizenship? In September of that year, it was birds of our country. The program was on the morning dove. So I went through all these programs and I just give you a little, a few of them there, but from 1923 to 1930, uh, the program covers were beautiful, done at a print shop. From 1930 until 1937, the effects of the depression are apparent. Programs were either typed or mimeographed and had no cover. The programs for two years were missing. In 1940, the covers reappeared, this time typed on construction paper. The print shop printing never came back. And the last program from the box dated from 1964. And I don't know the last year that Florence Johnson attended the club, I do know that Mrs. Johnson and her husband, Turk, celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary for in the same box were some beautiful white uh, 50th anniversary napkins with golden bells and the names Florence and Turk between the years 1920 and 1970. A neighbor told me that Mrs. Johnson died in 1981 the high school closed in 1967. The lumber yard and hardware store closed about the same time, but no one knows for sure when. The last gas station went after that. But back to those programs. The motto never changed. The sweet pea kept it standing. So did the pink and white club colors. The club collect written by Mary Stewart in 1904 and popular in women's groups, not only in the United States, but around the world, persisted month after month, year after year. So here it is, a collect for club women. Keep us, O oh God, from pettiness. Let us be large in thought, in word, in deed. Let us be done with fault finding and leave off self seeking. May we put away all pretense and meet each other face to face without self pity and without prejudice. May we never be hasty in judgment and always generous. Let us take time for all things, make us grow calm and serene, and, oh, Lord God, let us not forget to be kind. Uh, now, there's more to that, you know. Um, they, they said such things as grant us that we may realize it's the little things that create differences, that it's the big things of life. Um, and we're one. And may we strive to teach and know the great common woman's heart of us all. Now, the thing is, by modern standards, these people were poor. Uh, there was a kind of naivete among these relatively unschooled women. Some of their poetry was not good. Some of their ideas about the way the world works seem silly. Some of their club programs don't sound very interesting. Some sound tedious. 
but their monthly agendas were filled with decency, with efforts to learn about a wide variety of items, birds, our government, how to cope with their problems, the weather, diseases. Naive in some ways, perhaps, but they were living up to a far broader spectrum of their potential than most of us do today. So I'm not suggesting we go back to 1923 or even to 1964, but I will say that those women were farther along in the necessary journey to live responsibly, even as they were losing ground than we are. So there's something uh, touching and um, correct about it all. Mm -hmm. they, they were sinning. They were ex having virtue. I mean, I can, are there stories I can tell yeah. about uh, while the flower pot was placed on one side of the porch one day and on the other side of the porch another day. The overalls were hung upside down on the uh, uh you know, on the on the clothesline or straight up, those were signals. And uh, so uh, this is not to say that uh, the, the the moral uh, code was total and complete in all respects. But it is to say that uh, there was a decency that goes beyond, I will say now, given climate change and other things. <laughs> but I mean, if we didn't have climate change, we wouldn't be bothering about the other ways we're wrecking the, the, the potential for humans to continue to live here. Yeah. You know, back to the, the comment that this is not about mere nostalgia, but practical necessity. Uh, it's also not about pretending that people from another era were perfect somehow, that rural communities, as you point out, were without their problems. This is a theme in Wendell Berry's writing. You and Wendell are longtime friends, and his writing about rural America sometimes also is accused of being overly sentimental. But Wendell's books are full of not only that decency, but the problems people have because people are full of problems no matter where. Uh, and so these stories that look back, uh, they're entertaining in a lot of ways, but I would say this entire book is not just entertainment. You're telling stories to make a point, to, to put ideas out on the table for people to consider. Um, and I, I really find that uh, uh, really uh, thought provoking throughout the book. Uh, we're gonna turn it over to Sam now, who's gonna uh, get some of the questions. But before I do that, I just wanna make a connection to Matt Field Green today. So Wes, you said that the Land Institute, uh, yourself and some others bought property in Matt Field Green, but later sold it. Uh, that school that you mentioned, which the Land Institute owned, the old elementary school, uh, is still standing in Matt Field Green and it's being renovated. Uh, there's a group in Matfield Green who have established what they call the School for Rural Culture and Creativity. And they've got a great local project there in this, you know, effort to revitalize rural America. And if anybody's out that way, I, I recommend you stop and see it. it. It's a beautiful property now. And I'll make a plug for the school. Uh, I, I really like the people working on it. They're going to do a fundraiser to uh, be able to do some more renovation work there. And that's gonna be June 19th, that's a Saturday next month. So if anybody is interested in the School for Rural Culture and Creativity in Matfield Green, or interested in the details of that event on June 19th, um, just drop me a note. My name is in the, in the box there. And if you search on the internet for, for me, you'll find my webpage and an email address and all of that. And I'd love to connect people to what's going on in Matfield Green. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna hand it back to you, Sam. You've been monitoring the, the chat and the questions coming in and we'll, we'll open it up. Take it away, Sam. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, I, yeah, I'd like to again invite people to, to type questions um, in, the, in the chat on either Zoom or Facebook or um, on Zoom we also have the Q&A box. Any of those work equally well. Um, I did see that Steve, uh, Steve Richards, he wanted to just uh, say hello to, to Wes. He said that, um, that we were on the KW, KWU campus together 50 years ago, student and professor. So just a, a, hello, a hello there from him. Yeah, with regards to him, I certainly remember him. Fact, who was the student and who was the professor? <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> I could you um, could you say I think could you say a little bit more about perennial polyculture and and this um, this this transition from the annual um, you know the annual approach to farming that's practiced <clears throat> on most of the most of the agricultural land in Kansas. Yeah. Uh, and how could that how could that transition come about? Yeah. Well, the first of all, shutting down the interstate highway system will be easy. Um, the more difficult one um, we took up uh, way back in 1977 to solve the 10,000 year old problem of agriculture, and the the 10,000 year old problem of agriculture has to do uh, with the beginning of grain agriculture at the eastern end of the Mediterranean where it's been uh, drying out. And uh, that's where the greatest group of revolutionaries to ever live uh, came online giving up our crops and livestock. But the annual grains, you have to tear the ground up. And if you tear the ground up uh, every year, uh, or not even every year, you're going to loosen the soil and you're going to have erosion. And so the history of earth abuse became exasperated, starting with the growth of uh, the beginning of agriculture. Uh, so uh, several years ago, way back in 77, um, I had been reading the General Accounting Office um, study uh, that soil erosion that sound, seemed to me was just as bad in the 70s as when the Soil Conservation Service was formed uh, back in the uh, 30s. And I thought, how can this be, given thousands of miles of terraces, grass, waterways, and so on. I then took my students, uh, the interns from the land, to the Consa Prairie, and a prairie ecologist, Lloyd Holbert, uh, gave us a great day um, touring much of the Kanza. And, uh, uh, you know, I came back home uh, after that. And I was thinking about both that General Accounting Office study and also thinking about the, uh, uh, that prairie. There was no fossil fuel dependency to make that prairie work. There was no chemical contamination of the land and water. Uh, you know, what's, what's the deal here? Well, of course, those perennial roots in place. And so that's what set me off. Uh, and why did humanity never develop perennial grains? And why not the polycultures as uh, as the way nature works. And most of nature's um, uh, herbaceous, as opposed to woody ecosystems are, most of them uh, are perennials and grown in mixtures. So how hard is that? And why didn't we ever do it? And so when I first published on this, um, there in the 70s, late 70s, um, I said it'll take 50 to 100 years. Uh, so we then set our sights on that as a kind of a primary effort of the work of the land. But I like to remind uh, everybody that um, that particular effort 
was in fact a um, had the potential of mission drift because the larger consideration when we started the land was to look at the social, the political, the economic, uh, the the whole thing associated with the humans uh, destruction of potential for the human. So, um, but it became our lead effort. And now we have um, Kernza and we have friends in China that have perennial rice and uh, there is perennial rice that's spreading to the upland, the upland rice uh, in Vietnam, Cambodia, and elsewhere. So, uh, but there's still a lot of breeding that has to be done. Uh, but I'm, um, the problem is, is that we've got to be slowing down climate change, because if we don't, get that slowed down, then a lot of what we're doing with the perennial grains is uh, is going to be penalized. And if I can jump onto that, um, I said that when I first started reading Wes's work, you know, more than 30 years ago now, it, it kind of changed my vision. And this is a good example of that. Uh, when we think of environmental problems, or at least I used to think of environmental problems in a fairly limited way, you know, pollution and things like that. Uh, that we're all a product of the modern fossil fuel era. And Wes has worked, uh, expanded my vision, helped me understand that this is not only a new problem. And in the book I wrote, The Restless and Relentless Mind of Wes Jackson, uh, one of the key ideas I, I talk about is Wes's phrase that we are a species out of context. And uh, that really hit me when I first read Wes talking about that, that for most of our evolutionary history, we were a foraging species, hunters and gatherers. Agriculture, as Wes pointed out, is only 10,000 years old. It's a very new phenomenon. And it led to us living in very dramatically different ways than all of our ancestors. Uh, and so, you know, we think of the problems we have uh, and whenever we're talking about social, political, economic, and environmental problems, they all stem from this fact in some sense that we are a species out of context. Uh, and it's that kind of vision uh, in Wes's work that was really so powerful for me. And those are the kind of ideas I try to summarize in, in my book about Wes's work. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, we did, uh, Charlie, um, asked, early in, early in your work, you experienced resistance, if not antagonism, from land-grant universities. Is that changing? And then he added, by the way, thanks for mentioning Lloyd Holbert. <laughs> All right. I'm happy to mention Lloyd Holbert. He was <clears throat> he's kind of a saint in a way. Uh, as much sainthood as can be gained by any mortal, he seems to have it, had it. <clears throat> um, well, yes, uh, there was resistance, but um, the, that was also coupled with sort of ignoring it. Uh, you know, there's nothing that fails like success. You know, who are you to be talking about? Um, um, when we got humanity to feed, and how long is it going to take? And we know what we're doing. And we've had big stretches of what I call technological fundamentalism, which in my view is worse than almost any form of religious fundamentalism. Uh, but that's kind of going away. And uh, the, um, in fact, our folks, uh, we have graduate students and postdocs at the lands and people we support that are actually doing their work in land grant places. Uh, so uh, yeah, it was uh, pretty painful uh, because my, my background was in genetics and, uh, and I had come off of a farm. And so I would think, you know, that I was uh, one of them, uh, 
but clearly I wasn't. So, uh, but that's uh, that's the way things change. <laughs> I mean, things there is resistance, and uh, so maybe we ought to be suspicious of instant gratification. <laughs> Again, if I can piggyback, it reminds me of another uh, another thing Wes said long ago that was really important. This comes from one of your earlier books, Wes. You talk about the failures. Uh, and one of the failures uh, you talk about is the failure of success. Uh, so if you look at um, 20th century agriculture, post-World War II agriculture especially, yields for crops uh, doubled, tripled in some crops, quadrupled the green revolution technology, new petrochemicals, new fertilizers, herbicides, pests, all of that dramatically increased yields, which everybody took as a good thing, more food to feed hungry people. And you point out that that is an example of the failure of success that yes, in the short term, there was a dramatic increase in food production, but at what cost? So not only the soil erosion that you point out has been going on since the first annual grain plants, but then the increased chemical contamination of land and water, the soil degradation, you have less soil that's less healthy, that requires more and more inputs. And in that framework, all of a sudden that success starts to look more and more like a failure. And that's, I think, another uh, kind of hallmark of your work of looking past the superficial to ask what's really going on here over the long term. And uh, again, another one of those things that really changed the way I saw the world way back when I first started reading you. So uh, important work, uh, I think, as well as the the agronomics, the the social and and political as well. Um. Ann asked, how do you, well, um, how do you harvest Kernza, which by the way is delicious in bread? And I would add that, um, what is Kernza? Because I don't, I think I heard it mentioned, but I'm not sure what it is. Well, <clears throat> it's actually been a forage crop, intermediate wheat grass it is. It's a relative of wheat. Um, but uh, the selection was just selection with that species. It was not making crosses with uh, other species. We're doing that with wheat. Uh, uh, Xuan Wang is working on perennial wheat, but that's um, uh, getting uh, crosses between species. Um, it's, um, uh, it's low in gluten. Um, for some that's good. For others, that's not so good. You need going to need some gluten if you're going to get a decent loaf of bread, and so folks mix it, and so on. But uh, you know, I hear only compliments. They're also making beer out of it. We got to get the basics, I guess. Uh, <laughs> the question, Wes, was how do you harvest it since it's a oh, perennial oh, harvest? I forgot. Yeah, well, uh, you can harvest it with a combine uh and do but you know of course in our plots why a lot of our harvest is uh on, on everything from individual plants to individual rows to whatever yeah. Yeah. but no you can you can harvest it now the bigger question though is you see there's one thing that ought to be made clear here and that is that if we stop with perennial monoculture we've missed half the point. It's the perennial polyculture. Nature's ecosystems have tend to feature diversity. Uh, now, the question comes, how are you going to harvest a polyculture? And we've actually done some of that, actually doing it with annuals, uh, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. Those are agronomic uh, problems that uh, will have to be addressed. But, uh, you know, if uh, it, 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 uh, and it means the, uh, the maturity, uh, seeds being held on by some uh, uh, longer than they ordinarily would, who knows? There'll be a lot of that kind of adjustment in the breeding effort. Uh, but 
I think that the future of humanity is going to largely depend on the efficiencies that are inherent within the natural integrities. Why is it that nature tends to feature diversity? And there are a lot of good reasons for that. Uh, for one thing, species diversity is chemical diversity. And it takes a tremendous enzyme system on the part of an insect or a pathogen to give you the epidemic. So that's just part of the equation. Uh, so uh, look, we've, we've been at this now over 40 years. Um, when I said it's going to take 50 to 100 years, well, we're ahead in a certain sense. Uh, but we need more people working on this. I mean, we are actually engaged on six continents now, uh, one way or another, uh, with the various, uh, uh, the various um, crops. So, um, yeah, um, the larger question is, um, can we cut back on climate uh, increase the uh, heat, the planet heating up fast enough to be able to make the great transition for Homo sapiens. I mean, that's what's on the line right now to be able to cut. And if we do, think of what we'll have. We get rid of, we deal with two population problems. Too many people and too many things, too much stuff. And uh, they're both bad. We got to cut back on those now. But think of what we have gained as the consequence of all that highly dense carbon that we have used. Uh, First of all, what Amory Lovins called the young pulverized coal of the soil that gets translated into high seed yields. And then the cutting of the forests to sponsor the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. Um, and then uh, the coal, the oil, the natural gas. And so we go after this highly dense carbon. It's hot. We can't seem to say no to it. It's a kind of an imperative. Uh, we're sort of like bacteria on a petri dish with sugar. And away we go. Now, but think what we have gained. We now know of our origins. We now know where we come from. We now know all the way back to the Big Bang and how how uh, how the, uh, the 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 cosmos was was built. And uh, we also have. Uh, good information now on the journey from minerals to cells. And we didn't know that uh, much a, a century ago. Uh, I like to quote George Wald. Um, it's one of the most poetic things that tells it in a short way. We living things are the late outgrowth of the metabolism of our galaxy. The carbon that enters so importantly in our bodies was cooked in the remote past of a dying star. And from it at lower temperatures came nitrogen and oxygen. And these are indispensable elements were spewed out into space to mix and form planets and eventually we ourselves. The ancient seeds set the pattern of ions in our blood. The ancient atmospheres molded our metabolism. Think of that. That's something we have verifiable information as a result of the science. And we would not have had that if we had not become that species out of context. So the challenge now is if we can just put the brakes on, on the climate issue and hang on to all of that and have an agriculture that mimics nature's ecosystems in some degree, the human family will have 
been a glorious, glorious uh, event. Uh, and so th there we are. I mean, the, the future is, is so, <laughs> the, the, the lure of that ought to be enough for us to apply the brakes. And uh, that's our challenge. But that's the problem with the being highly dependent upon the carbon. We've got to, got to uh, put caps and have rationing. Uh, read Stan Cox's uh, books. Um, he's got what three titles he ought to probably give his titles. Yeah, uh, Stan Cox is uh, uh, TLI, uh, Land Institute Staff Staffer. Uh, Stan was a sorghum breeder before that, a wheat breeder. So he comes out of the science side, the plant breeding, but he shifted now into the Ecosphere Studies program, which Sam, you mentioned, uh, which is more of the education and outreach. And Stan's most recent book is called The Green New Deal and Beyond. And in it, Stan uh, says the Green New Deal is just fine, but we have to go even further. And Wes highlighted uh, a key aspect of that is being able to set a hard limit on the amount of carbon we, we burn, on the energy we consume, the materials that we take out of the, the earth. Uh, Stan has a new book coming out that's uh, extending that work. Uh, and I was just gonna reflect, Wes, we're, we're, I know we're gonna wind up pretty soon. Uh, in that one answer, you went from uh, the nuts and bolts of plant breeding, uh, the application uh, of that to actually growing crops, the agronomic challenges, uh, to the social context, all set in what we know about ourselves from science. Uh, and I think that really captures what for me always made the Land Institute a, a special place. It wasn't just specializing in a particular research track. It, it was looking always at the big picture. And uh, I'm starting to feel like the event coordinator for uh, Central Kansas here, but uh, I'd, I'd recommend to anybody who's never been to Prairie Festival that they think about attending that. Prairie Festival is, is the annual gathering at the Land Institute of friends and, and staff to explore these ideas. It's always the last weekend in September that in 2021, that will be September 24th through 26th. And obviously with the virus, there was no in-person Prairie Festival last year, uh, but uh, tentatively at least they're planning to, to bring people together in that barn again, uh, a barn that Wes, you built. <laughs> with well, help. help on that barn. <laughs> yes, yes, but uh, it's a great place to connect to the history of the Land Institute, the current work the, the plot tours, uh, being able to go around with the scientists, with the plant breeders while they explain their work, tours of the greenhouse. Um, it's a great weekend. I, you know, it's the only, uh, the only trip I, I take every year for sure. You know, whatever else is going on in my life, the last weekend in September, I'm gonna be at Prairie Festival. So if people want more information about that, you can find it on the Land Institute website. I recommend you sign up for their email list. Uh, I always look forward to getting the monthly newsletter. Uh, some really great work uh, going on at the Land Institute. All from that to connect this back west where we started to that fateful decision you and your family made in 1976 to, to leave that cushy job in California with all those groovy California people yeah. and, uh, and build something in Kansas. And I just wanted to say uh, it's an extraordinary achievement. I know you didn't do it alone, and I know you're going to talk about all the people who helped. Yeah. Uh, but the Land Institute is that. It is an extraordinary achievement, and I'm, I'm really grateful to be able to work uh, with you and other folks there. So, Sam, I'll, I'll hand it back to you. Well, no, wait a minute. I got a plug I want to make here. <laughs> that is uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Aubrey Strike Krug and mm -hmm. her citizen science yeah. Uh, effort, which uh, is taking ecosphere studies, connecting with the scientists, and uh, um, you might just check in with the Land Institute and what that program is all about. Yeah.
if we are able to make it, uh, that is going to be so important for the citizens to have efforts in, um, in, 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 in an agriculture that is based on the way nature's ecosystems work. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, you have, if you have time for uh, another question or two, oh, we got some more here. Sure. Um, this is a big question from David, and I think you, you two have touched on it some. Um, how do you both envision how we power down? How, how can we make do with less electricity or less fossil fuel? Yeah. <laughs> Well, next question. Uh, <laughs> no, that's that's of course the uh, um, the challenge. Um, well, we've talked about uh, the politically. Uh, this will take a political effort to put a cap on the mines, the wellheads, the port of entry, and um, and then have a kind of rationing. Uh, the, uh, uh, if, if it, you can't do everything all at once, you can't just cold Turkey, uh, but we can begin the journey and we will discover a lot of ways to cut. Um, well, here's one, maybe just maybe. Um, say an organization like the Land Institute the start is, is reading the meters and getting the results on kilowatts and then have that every month and see if we can, to what extent we can be cutting along the way. And I almost, I hate to say this, but what about a different kind of prairie festival? Uh, what about a prairie festival in which, um, say, there are buses that, say, start in Kansas City, come along the way, you can go out and meet the bus and come on to the prairie festival on buses. Or I would like on a train, you know, why not trains coming from Minneapolis or whatever? you know, begin to use our imagination about what is here in ways that we can cut. And my bet is that we will find wonderful times on those buses or on those trains as we are making our way to the Prairie Festival. <clears throat> our imaginations have been limited because we haven't had to think. We haven't had to think hard and now We've really, there's an old saying, there's nothing that concentrates the mind like waiting to be hanged, you know? So <laughs> that, uh, there's nothing that concentrates the mind like uh, uh, thinking about what we must do. Uh, so there is no one size fits all on the down power. Yeah. I, I would just add that um, I think everybody understands that in the current political uh, climate, uh, the, the kind of action needed is not going to happen. Uh, but take Stan Cox's book that I mentioned. Stan outlines how uh, step by step over a process of years, we could limit the amount of energy we consume. And as West points out, institute a rationing program so that what we do use is distributed fairly. Now, Stan doesn't think that's going to be passed in the next Congress, but remember that it's good to have ideas uh, kind of lying around so that when a crisis comes, there's a well thought out plan to pursue it. And at the same time, of course, and this is a, a theme of Wes's, you don't wait around for government to act to start making modifications, not only in, in a personal life, because we all know that you know personal actions aren't going to change the direction of society alone. But at the community level, uh, you see this all over the country, uh, increased interest in, in gardening together, people learning uh, the domestic arts, uh, learning to cook in ways they, 
they might not have known before. All of that is part of it. it no one part of it is a solution. And I think at some point, and this is the, the theme of a book Wes and I are working on now, we just have to recognize that this, this high energy game for 8 billion people just can't be sustained. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a saying in the environmental movement that you can't negotiate with the laws of physics and chemistry. <laughs> you know, we can negotiate with each other, but when it comes to the material realities of the world, uh, the laws of physics and chemistry don't negotiate. And so there's an inevitability to this as well. I don't think anybody has an answer in, in, you know, to wrap everything up. I don't think anybody really has even the beginning of an answer yet. We're still struggling with that. Yeah. Um, oh, Steve, Steve asked, what do we do until we get perennial crops? We have, we have transitioned to no-till. We could see soil erosion and conventional tillage. It was only a matter of time until we didn't have anything to farm. So I, I guess question, questioning like, you know, about farmers that have implemented no-till, what are some things that they could do next? Yeah, well, it's a tough one. Um, you know, the, the problem of uh, uh, we have to poison our soils to save them. Uh, and um, that's uh, one of the great, the great uh, enigmas of the time. Uh, well, one thing, I think we could begin to grasp down more of our landscape. Uh, and um, the, uh, uh, <laughs> at the same time, and this becomes paradoxical, I begin to um, uh, eat lower on the food chain. Uh, but grass down and hold uh, land and change, change the diets. Uh, I've been amazed at how much diet change has happened. Uh, happened among people that I could never have imagined it. Uh, so the, our overall consumption of stuff uh, and overall consumption of, um, of food for that matter. Uh, could reduce the assault on the dis, uh, on the land. Uh, now the problem is the numbers are still going up, and um, although I see that the rate, I was reading the New York Times this morning, the rates are are going down, the rates of population, but we're still adding. Uh, we're adding something like uh, I. We added as many people last year as more than the state of Kansas. I think it's around over 3 million. So, uh, well, this is where you throw up your hands. And uh, I just finished writing a little something for this book that Bob and I are working on about hope. And I used to say, I'm not, uh, I'm not optimistic, but I'm hopeful. And I've quit using the word hope. Uh, I think that there's a different way to simply bear down on what we can do. And uh, first of all, recognize that this, uh, species of ours, uh, especially in industrial societies, is caught up in a Ponzi scheme that started 10,000 years ago. And we keep thinking we're going to get ahead. But, uh, uh, and that's, of course, what Ponzi people do. But this Ponzi scheme, uh, the most we can hope for in this Ponzi scheme is uh, soften the landing, soften the landing.
Okay, okay. well, um, I think- You wanted uh, on a happy note? Is that <laughs> well, I, I got a better ending than Wes for this. Uh, and again, this is part of this new project we're working on. And I know Wes is, has used this many times, but I remember the first time he said it to me on a phone call. I think Wes, you were just all walking on your own your own land there. And you said, why is this not enough? And you were reflecting just on the beauty around you, the simple pleasure of you know being on that land. And you said, why is this not enough for us humans? You know, why do we have to have uh, stadiums full of, you know, gladiate modern gladiators and, and Las Vegas casinos and cruise vacations? Uh, those are all products of a high energy era that's coming to an end. And it's easy to be scared of the end of that. But I think, Wes, you've always focused on what's there for us when the, the high energy era is over. And it was captured in that question, why is this not enough? And of course it is enough. It's been enough for people through most of our species history. It's only recently that we, we started to get other kinds of expectations. And so uh, maybe that's a, I'm looking for a happy ending here and it ain't easy, but uh, as people are you know, just out in the world, I think that's a good question to ask ourselves. Why is this not enough? Uh, family, friends, the affection of people we care about, and a world um, that is endlessly beautiful. Uh, yeah. Everywhere you turn, there's endless beauty, and I think that is enough. So, One of the stories in the book has to do with my friend Leland, mm -hmm. who grew up 30 miles south of here, and for 29 years got by on $500 a year or less, and lived in a shack six by 16 feet, and his explanation was, I do this because it's easy. Because it's easy. Now, if here a human being was able to get to the point of doing it, not out of some sacrifice, but because it's easy, then that's at least one, one person in the world uh, <laughs> that was able to do that. And was he eccentric? No, he had a little car, Carmagia. And, uh, you know, he, he actually reduced the length of that car. He cut it down and it looked like Donald Duck's car. And he would go off to the library uh, in McPherson and get books and bring them back to his shack. Uh, he, he reckoned that he spent $350 a year on gasoline and tobacco, and the rest of it was on essentials. So there's something about the essential versus that ratio doesn't change even for somebody that scaled it down. Uh, so there are, there are examples. And we, our imaginations are limited because, I don't know, maybe we're fearful. Uh, maybe we're fearful. So we haven't, we're about to begin the journey that uh, maybe we ought to consider ourselves destined for in the sense that we would go into overshoot for a 10,000 year period, come to our senses just in time and have them, they carry with it the memory of all we picked up as a species that, that was asking the question, where do we come from? And what kind of a thing are we? And now what's hanging in the balance is the great question, what's to become of us? And so here we are. Uh, and in a way, it's kind of exciting to be at this particular moment uh, to, uh, uh, well, it must have been exciting, I suppose, when the dinosaurs got wiped out. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, I think I, this, we can do it. The question is, um, will, we, will we be able to do the thinking and uh, the hard thinking and make the hard commitment? 
Well, I've got the perfect ending. One is to hold up the books and remind people that they'll be coming into the Newton Library soon and they're available in all the booksellers. Uh, and also, I just wanted, we talked about this a bit before, Sam, I just wanted to thank the Newton Library. When I went online and looked at the kind of programming you all do, it was really exciting. Uh, I'm a big fan of libraries, public libraries especially. Uh, and I just wanted to not only thank you all for organizing this, but to tell you, you've got an impressive program going there. And uh, I look forward to someday visiting the Newton Library in person. So thank you, Sam. And on behalf of the Land Institute and, and everybody else that counts, I thank you too. <laughs> Great. Yeah, and uh, I'll, I'll thank you two right back. This has been um, super thought provoking and enjoyable. Um, so appreciate it. And I will just say, um, I'm definitely gonna look at, at going to that Prairie Festival because it's just a short drive for um, us Newton folks. So it's definitely a great opportunity. Right. So thank all you right. all so much. Thanks, okay. everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye bye. Right. Everybody.